Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today we're back at Duelist Den. And our subject today is this beautiful Civil War original Smith carbine. Now, this was the fourth most issued carbine among Union cavalry in the Civil War. So, let's take a look at it and uh, maybe make Evil Roy dance a little bit. So the Smith carbine was invented by a doctor, Dr. Gilbert Smith of Buttermilk Falls, New York. And I just love that name for a town. I love that name, Buttermilk Falls, but if you're looking for it on the map of New York, you're not going to find it. Because in the early 20th century, they uh, went from an unincorporated village to an incorporated town. And at that time, they changed their name from Buttermilk Falls to Highland Falls. Uh, it's almost like they picked the dullest suburban name they could when they had a cool name like Buttermilk Falls. But there is still a Buttermilk Falls in New York. It's near Ithaca. It's a state park, but it's just not the same. Uh, and Dr. Smith was a firearms tinkerer, like a lot of people seem to have been in the mid-19th century. Tinkerers with one thing or another. It was the great age of invention. And he actually filed three patents uh, related to the Smith Carbine in 1857. So, Dr. Smith went out and had 300 Smith Carbines built, custom-made by a gunsmith at his own expense, and sent them off to the Army, to the, uh, the Ordnance Board, to try to interest them in his, his you know, brainchild. So the Army gave him a look over, and when they were done with them, actually, the, uh, the story is that they passed a number of them on to the Pony Express. So, you know, besides the military context, we have some of these guns possibly being used by Pony Express riders, which, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, in 1860, the Army put the Smith Carbine through its trials, and they liked it. Uh, they liked it quite a bit, and they ordered a few thousand of them in 1860 because, of course, war was in the air and uh, it was time to start stocking up. So Dr. Smith kind of got in before the other carbines of the Civil War, which, which is an interesting fact. So, you know, Dr. Smith was not an arms manufacturer himself, so he went out and got three companies involved in manufacturing Smith carbines. There was the American Machine Works, the Massachusetts Arms Company, and the American Arms Company. And uh, mine was made by American Machine Works. Now, ultimately, the Union bought just over 30,000 Smith carbines. And because they were such, uh, such an early carbine, virtually all of them were issued to troops. And that's not the case with some of the others that, that have much higher production numbers. But the Smith was the fourth most issued carbine, or carbine, depending on where you live in the country, of the Civil War. And if you're wondering what that ranking was, the, the Spencer uh, was number one. And of course that was the metallic cartridge carbine. And it's, it's no doubt that once they got it, the troops loved that. Uh, in fact, if it hadn't been for kind of going or an end around right to President Lincoln, we probably never would have had the Spencer, which is, I would say, the best, uh, the best of the combat small arms for cavalry, anyway, used during the Civil War. So Spencers, there were 144,500 of them made. The government bought 107,000 of those and issued a great deal of them, I think around 80,000. Sharps was number two. Uh, they made 115,000 of the Sharps carbines. And they issued about 80,000 of those to the troops as well. So number three was the Burnside carbine. That used a, kind of an odd... Uh, brass cartridge, but not not a self-primed cartridge. So you still you still had priming to go through and all that. Uh, Fifty-five thousand of those were made, and almost all of them were issued. 
So for the Smith, like I said, it was 30,062 made. Virtually all of them were issued. Uh, and, well, after 1862, when we started to get the Sharps out there and uh, Spencers out there, uh, the Smiths kind of fell from favor. So, you know, they were, they were kind of replaced on the line in, in a number of cases uh, with some of the, I guess I, I'd say better in some regards, uh, carbines. So the Smith was a 50 caliber brake top design, you know, like, say, like an over and under shotgun, a double barrel shotgun, uh, a hinged brake top design, single shot, and it had a split chamber, and I'm going to show you that in a few minutes. And it fired a pretty unique cartridge. Uh, it wasn't paper, it wasn't brass. It was made out of India rubber. And these days they make them out of kind of a nylon plastic. But they're highly effective and they could be reloaded, though in point of fact, uh, in the heat of combat, troops weren't trying to save them. <laughs> you know, they were mostly throwing them away and pulling a fresh one out. So, so they didn't get reloaded all that much. The gun has a 21.6 inch barrel and it's 38 inches overall. So I said it weighs about eight pounds, uh, which is, I think, a little on the heavy side for such a, uh, such a compact weapon. Now certainly the Smiths were all bought by the federal government for Union troops. However, early in the war, a large number of them were captured by the Confederates and they were able to arm several regiments with them. So the Smiths fought on both sides of the war. I've tried to determine what units use the Smith carbine. I come up with 11 regiments. And I'm going to put those down in the description area of the video rather than reading them all out to you. But, uh, you know, if you're a reenactor and you want to know if, if a Smith carbine is appropriate to your unit, or you're just interested in a unit maybe that was raised in your area, uh, take a look down the description area, and you can see if if that unit was armed with Smiths or not. Now, as I said, the Smiths used a cartridge made of India rubber. And India rubber got to be in short supply as the war went on. So the government experimented with Smith cartridges made of cardboard, of metal foil, uh, of, of thin sheet metal and they all worked to a degree uh, none were as effective as the India rubber cartridge but as, as the war went on different kinds of Smith cartridges were out there by 1862 the initial shipments of the Smith carbines were in the hands of the troops they were delivered with a price of about thirty dollars a piece so each Smith Smith carbine uh, has three sets of markings on it that can be a little bit confusing, and they're a little hard to read because the uh, the sling the sling bar is right over them. So I'll show you what I mean. If you look at the receiver here, you can see above the sling bar that says Pulteney and Tremble. All right, so they were the the contractors who handled the manufacturing. Uh, the other marking is right under the sling bar, and then there's one that runs basically vertical across the sling bar. And, and let me show you those. All right, so here we are with the sling bar off, and you can see right where the sling bar went across the receiver. That says Smith's Patent, June 23rd, 1857. Uh, and, and I've chalked these just to make them a little bit more visible, but they're still difficult to read. So then the marking that goes basically vertically across the receiver is the actual manufacturers. In this case, it's the American Machine Works, uh, and they're in Springfield, Massachusetts, and everything is, is highly abbreviated, and it's all almost impossible to read with that sling bar on there, but, but that's what you'll see for markings. The sighting equipment is fixed blade, 
and then ladder for ele for elevation. Uh, it is adjustable for windage by dovetail tapping a little bit. I mean, some of these guys are not, uh, but this one is, and that is a good thing. The, the battle sights were set at about 200 yards. If you saw my sighting in video, you'll know that I had uh, David Stavlo put a higher front sight on it so I could file it down and get a 50-yard zero for planking around with this. Uh, he also lightened the trigger up for me a bit because, man, this, this thing has a, uh, a mainspring that came out of a 32 Ford. I mean, it is amazingly stiff. So we got a trigger pull down to about 7 pounds, which is livable compared to like the 15 or 20 that it had before. Uh, but it's, it's just kind of a fascinating little gun. You know, it certainly breaks very cleanly, the, the trigger does, so it's eminently shootable. So this is it, Smith Carbine, fourth most popular <laughs> cavalry arm of the Union forces. So the Smith Carbine was, you know, of an age where breech loaders were still highly experimental. And now they'd gone back for 30, 40 years to the hall here in the United States. But the problem with breech loaders <coughs> had always been containing the gases when you fired uh, to get a real tight gas seal so you didn't get escaping flames and lose pressure and all sorts of things like that. So, you know, Sharps, for instance, used a paper or linen cartridge, and there was no containment when that burned at all, so the breech plate had to do all the work. It had to be very tight-fitting to work. Now, the Smith carbine took a different approach. That's its cartridge, and it used an India rubber cartridge casing. Now these are these are nylon plastic, but uh, the originals were India rubber, and the way it worked was was kind of ingenious. It's a break top action, so if you're used to like a double barrel shotgun, it's it's very much the same. There's a little lever right here inside the trigger guard. You push that up, it raises this bar, which the whole bar is a gigantic spring takes it over the latch and exposes the chamber. Then the cartridge goes in the chamber. But the Smith uses something called the split breech design. So you can see that cartridge is sticking halfway out. And the rest of the chamber is back here inside the breech plate. And the reason for that is because there's no ejectors on these things. So you need your fingers to be able to grasp the cartridge to pull it out after you fire. All right, so that's it. Loaded, close it, and of course it requires a cap, but then we'd be ready to go. Well, Evil Roy is using the fog of war to terrorize and pillage the good people of Blymeyer's Hollow. So we've been dispatched with our trusty Smith carbine to put him back in his place. That'll teach them. Okay, so after firing, it unloads the same way. We open it up. You can see that the cartridge uh, is half exposed, the fired cartridge. We remove it with our fingers and load a fresh one. Or not. So just to give you a less obstructed view, um, that bar is a big spring. And you can see the locking lug on the rear half of the receiver. And you can see that brass button. When you push the finger lever in the trigger guard up, that flexes that spring off of the locking lug. And that's how you open the gun. Uh, then we've got the two sides of the chamber. So you can see the front half of the chamber and the back half of the chamber. And to help form a slightly better mating surface and gas seal on that, you can see that there's a concave extension 
or a convex, I should say, extension on the front of the chamber and a concave indent to seal on the back of the chamber. So in the previous video in the series, I showed uh, just briefly how to make the ammunition for the Smith carbine. And uh, I just wanted to show you a friend of mine in California, Hugh Knight, uh, who's a big fan of historical shooting. Uh, he does a great deal of it himself. Uh, he made me up some historically correct packaging for the Smith carbine. So these boxes hold 10 shots, 10 cartridges, uh, and a dozen uh, percussion caps. And they are very neat. And this, this is a big thing in the historical shooting community is making the authentic packaging to go with your gun. So these would have come, you know, in, a, in basically a case. And soldiers would have been issued boxes of these things, and they would have been opening them up and stuffing them into their cartridge boxes and their haversacks and you know, everywhere they could uh, to get enough ammo to get through a fight. Well, we still have a little more work to do. Evil Roy enlisted the aid of Swingin' Sam and the Circle Gang. Then we got to clear them out of the hollow, too. Well, that's it. Blymar's Hollow is once again safe for the honest folk. Well, let's try a shot at the 75-yard steel plate out there and see how we do. Got him. Okay, well, I've been shooting the Smith Carbine for a couple of days now, you know, a couple of rain sessions. And uh, I've formed some definite opinions about it. The first thing I have to say is I like it. Now, this is an original, but Pieta uh, makes a very nice replica of it. So if you don't want to get an original, you can get a replica. The, the interesting thing about this is you can get an original in pretty good shape for about the cost of a replica. That's these days. So these guys are not tremendously expensive. I mean, they're, they're not giveaway prices, but the replicas are quite expensive too. So you can go either way. As, as I'm filming this, it's pretty much impossible to find a replica in this country. They've all been sold out. And uh, you've got to wait till the next shipment comes in from Pieta, which... Who knows when that's going to be. So, if you can find one on the used market, go for it. Uh, or look, look for a good original. And you won't be unhappy. Now, 
as I mentioned, I sent this to Dave at uh, Lodgewood Manufacturing. I'll put his info down below. And what David did for me is, first of all, he replaced the nipples. And, and I send all of my original cap and balls or percussion guns to Dave. The nipples are almost always frozen in place because our ancestors did not use anti-seize before they put them in and they're always rusted in place and eroded and unusable. And uh, these carbines tend to get the, the flash channel packed up with junk because they've been sitting around for ages, you know, collecting grease in there and rust and whatever. So he cleared out that, put a new clean out screw on, did a trigger job for me uh, and put the higher front sight on. So that costs under $200 to do that, you know, added to the cost of the gun. So eminently worth it to, to get one, even with some issues, as long as the issues aren't awful, and send it to David. As long as it's got a good bore, you'll get a gun that's a good shooter back, and it won't cost you a whole lot of money to, to get the work done. So what do I think about it? I think it's a lot of fun. I, I really enjoy shooting this gun. Uh, I mean, it's quite accurate. Uh, the recoil is minimal because really it's kind of like a 45 Colt round on steroids. You know, it's only 35 grains of powder, a little bit heavier bullet, 50 caliber, but it's, it's not a high powered round. You know, you don't, you're not getting smacked around with this thing. So it's pleasant to shoot, accurate, balances well, and yeah, it might even be more fun to shoot than the Sharps. I'm still I'm on the fence about that because that Sharps is a ball to shoot, but, uh, but this is right up there. Absolutely a fun gun. Now, what do I think of it as a cavalry weapon? That's a little bit different because... I've got to say, it's a little bit awkward to load and unload uh, because you got to get that cartridge case out of there, and it's a, there's some manipulation involved that slows things up. I mean, compared to a sharp, so you just drop the breech block, right? And because it's a combustible cartridge, after you shoot it, it's all gone. You just shove a new one in and put a cap on. Uh, but this is a little bit different. Obviously, you have to fish the old cartridge out, then put a new one in, put the cap on. And I'm sure as I shoot it more, I'll develop a rhythm for that. I have not yet developed a rhythm for it. So, you know, when you saw me, like, shooting uh, Swinging Sam and the Circle Gang, um, I was fumbling around over there. I'm sure when your life's on the line, you get a lot more facile with, <laughs> with your loading technique. <laughs> Or, or you don't get the opportunity to get more facile at it, right? So, uh, but I think, as, as anybody with any common sense would, that if I had the opportunity to trade this thing in for a Spencer, well, give me that Spencer. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm fully on board with that. Uh, and I, I think I'd probably rather have a Sharps in combat than have this. I mean, this has the benefit of the cartridges are very durable and they stand up to, to heavy handling, uh, which, which is great. Sharps, not quite so much, but those linen cartridges are pretty durable as well, you know? So they're kind of close on that. Uh, and with the Sharps, you don't have to fumble to uh, extract the, the fired casing. So I kind of give the nod to that gun over this one as a cavalry gun. But for just general plinking around, boy, this is hard to beat. <laughs> it really is. And it's fun. It's, it's got a fun action. It's, uh, you know, it's a mechanical object, which are always fun to play with. So it gives you something to do. So I would say, <laughs> if you're looking for a good Civil War gun, uh, this is not a bad choice at all. Not a bad choice at all. So, anyway, those are my thoughts. Uh, 
I'd wish you a Merry Christmas, but you're seeing this probably the week after Christmas. So I hope you had a nice Christmas. Or Hanukkah. As the case may be. And I'll see you next week.